Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to the Virtual Stars Podcast. How are my loyal listeners? Thank you for your continued support. And remember, click that subscribe button, everybody. This is a very special episode because Tad Stones boards the mothership. He's the creator, director, and writer of Darkwing Duck. Now come aboard as we go traversing the stars. Oh, Mr. Stones, thank you so much for coming to the Traverse the Stars podcast. Hey, happy to be here. It's a great honor to talk with you, sir. You are a very important part of my childhood. Darkwing Duck was fantastic, so thank you so much. Yeah, well, I enjoyed it too. So I actually read that you began your career as an imagination trainee at Walt Disney Feature Animation. So how did you first get involved with Disney? Um, I Well, going way back, um, my dad worked for Carnation Company. So the company Picnic was always, because of its connection to Disneyland, um, company Picnic once a year was always at Disneyland. And the weird thing, it was at a park that is now the Pirates of the Caribbean, but it used to be just a park with picnic tables and grass. And it, it seemed perfectly normal at the time. But looking back on it, I now say, because they they put up a big tent and have the uh, Golden Horseshoe Review show, or at least Wally Bogue and, hmm. and uh, some of the acts. And then they would play bingo. And now I look back on it and say, Disneyland is right. <laughs> there 50 feet away through those gates which they would eventually open we'd go in through the back way so uh, uh, i'm gonna interrupt just one second for my listeners so the name of your father's company was well because I, I don't know actually what they do why they kind of do oh the carnation do. company yeah which is uh a used to do basically deliver milk uh so it was a dairy company and then got into pet food and and you know little friskies friskies dog food I don't know if that stuff is still around anymore. Um, so how does that but anyway, to on the connection to Disneyland is they had uh, a cafe on Main Street called the Carnation Cafe, I believe. And in fact, they used to have one of the restaurants too, I think. But it was always, uh, you know, it was basically one of the sponsors of Disneyland. Oh, that is absolutely awesome. I, I for some reason, I'm just surprised with having... Um... I guess from nowadays, milk delivery to Disney World. This is, you know, Disneyland. You kind of just imagine everything just is like there. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, my dad, my dad had wanted to be a, a comic strip artist. Actually, he wanted to be an editorial cartoonist. So I grew up with a lot of how-to cartoon books, uh, including the famous artists cartoonist course. Um, and so, any interest I had in cartoons or comics or animation, he was fine with. It wasn't like, why don't you get a real job or something? <laughs> um, so then anyway, I went to, so that's just a general background of Disney. That was very close to it. I got the art of animation book when I was at Disneyland where it was sold uh, the original version by Bob Thomas, which was focused around uh, Sleeping Beauty, but they went through every step. In high school, I was feeling like, you know, what am I going to do? I kind of flirted with the idea of going to comics. I, and I felt like I wanted to be in animation, but the only place worth working at, my uh, girlfriend's sweet mate uh, was uh, Tori Atencio, daughter of Ex Atencio, who's a Disney artist, worked with Ward Kimball closely. And then he went into Imagineering uh, where he was at the time. Uh, anyway, she mentioned there's this training program because evidently Disney did feel they had the guys they needed until some of their movies started making, it seems silly now, but like Robin Hood was a big success at like $6 million or whatever it did in domestic, which was huge back then. So it was kind of like, what have you guys done to keep this going? And you're talking to a staff of veterans who always assumed they'd be shut down. <laughs> Because, because when Walt kind of moved into audio animatronics and that kind of thinking, you know, Roy even thought about shutting it down. Walt said, no, these are the guys who built the company with me. You know, let's let them go till they retire or whatever. Uh, so they always felt they were on borrowed time. But I think it was Jungle Book, was, which was the last film Walt worked on, was a big success, too. And And suddenly it was like in the very early 70s, they started this training program. I graduated in 74. Uh, I had an 
a meeting with uh, you know a department head about the training program like just before my birthday in May. And so I graduated and then three days later, I started at Disney Studios as a trainee. Now as a trainee then it was just us in a room and Eric Larson, one of the nine old men in the room next door. And you would just, he would take you through the basics, which I kind of knew already. I wish I had spent more time with Eric actually, but it was like all about getting your tests done. Because you had, I think, four weeks to do a test. And then if you survived that, you had another four weeks to do a test. And then after that, and then you started as an in-betweener. Um, after that, if you wanted to move up, it was all about taking your own time to do personal tests. And if you got good enough, you might get a scene handed to you to try out from a feature film. And the idea is that you had to have a 100 feet in a film uh, to get a credit or to become an animator. I forget how it was, but by the time I got there, all the rules had changed because basically a lot of the trainees had done the bulk of the work on the latest Winnie the Pooh featurette, which I don't know if that was Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2 or whatever, the third one. Um, and they kind of, you know, they didn't strike, but they <laughs> near rioted. The idea is that you're holding us to these old you know, you know, benchmarks that have been around since the beginning. And yet it's just a half hour project. So if you did this much of the project, it meant you did a huge chunk of that piece of entertainment. And so uh, by the time I got there, some of those guys <laughs> were then animators and all that. So uh, I came in right after Ron Clemens, who people would know from all the great films he did with uh, John Musker, like little things like Little Mermaid and yeah. Moana and uh, Treasure Planet and Aladdin. Um, anyway, so Ron came in right before me. And then three months after, I'd say Glenn Keane came. And that's, you know, every once in a while we'd pick in a new person until CalArts was and Eric Larson helped set the curriculum for CalArts. But they started coming up with like, some people were like John Musker would have been taken directly into the studio, but they wanted to help the beginning of this Cal Arts character animation program. So John went there. So, you know, John was in a class with Brad Bird, Jerry Reese, Tim Burton, Henry Selleck, you know, little names. Um, anyway, that's, that's how I got into animation is basically uh, my girlfriend, who's now my wife, <laughs> You know, introduced me to her, her sweet mate who knew about the training program. And I got in after that. And then I nearly got fired because I was so bad at in between. <laughs> what, what, just... what, what was it keeping up with what the art already looked like? Or what was the problem with the in between that was that you was? No, it hard? was just like I went, it was just a mental thing in that years later, I said, oh, that's what it's all about. And I realized they should have explained it differently. And then I thought about it and I went, no, they explained it perfectly. I just <laughs> get it. Because when you in between something, I mean, you've got, I'm sure people basically know animation. You do extreme poses, like the beginning of an action, the, then, you know, a throw. And then maybe there's a breakdown in between. Somebody draws a line to show you, well, this is the arc I want to follow. And then somebody's got to do all those little drawings that go in between. And the more drawings together, the slower it goes farther apart the faster it moves um well what you don't do is literally just look at lines and draw the line in between because that's a 2d statement and early computer animation did this and and it's just this weird morphing thing that would happen um what you really have to think of is as a sculpture. And it's like, think of this drawing as a sculpture, and this drawing as a sculpture, and you have to do the sculpture in between. Maybe that would have gotten through. <laughs> it was just, I was just very, very bad at it. And I got, I remember I did, um, and I, I went home every night with headaches. I was doing these alligators in The Rescuers, because that was the feature film going on when I started uh, for Dale Bear. And I, you know, I could, they had all these little bumps on their backs. And if you got them and you're talking about the width of a pencil lead, you know, off, they would move back and forth instead of being moving forward. Um, 
so that you know that was kind of like i don't know how i survived basically <laughs> but uh uh later when they finished the scene they put fog over it it's like no one's seeing the bumps on the backs uh so whatever from the when I, while i was at features i started moving into story i did um some storyboards on fox and hound uh i wasn't credited because back then there was like they were very stingy with the credits and it didn't bother me until they gave a credit to squeaks the worm what? as himself well, this is a little cute worm that these bugs, that these birds would always chase. And he got a credit, you know, as a joke, because he was a sound effect. So it squeaks as himself. And it's like, yeah, it's funny for you who has a credit <laughs> for those of us who don't. So it's nice now if you look up, people fill in all the credits and wiki pages. And uh, a lot of us who are toiled there, um, at least somewhere you know as as much as you could trust wiki because every once in a while i get a notification that i guess people do it for clicks or something they just throw out bogus credits um and and non-existent films you know <laughs> and they'll put like five production companies there at disney warner brothers paramount and it's like you know they never they don't work together <laughs> um anyway we rambled a bit but that's how i got into animation basically i found out about this little training program later on they, when suddenly, this is after Michael Eisner and Jeffrey Katzberg came, they really needed a lot of animators to get that training. And they did a much more formal training program that was with teachers and students kinds of situations and testing and, and all of that. Uh, so that was much later. Our training program was just basically Eric Larson. And of course, all the guys who came from CalArts had been taught by ex Disney guys, basically, mm -hmm. and they had better training than a lot of us did in that they worked with, you know, some great layout artists and story men and storyboard people and um, as well as animators under Jack Hanna to begin with. Um, so I, I look around at the talent in the industry right now and I said, oh, I'm so glad I got in when I did because <laughs> I don't think I'd make it now, you know, so there goes that career. <laughs> Rick, I mean, your your art is phenomenal. Because every so often, you sell prints, uh, original work of uh, like Darkwing Duck. As we'll get to in a little while, and I can't imagine there's a issue of confidence when your work looks like that. Um, couple things. I've my job has always allowed me to hire people more talented than myself. <laughs> I mean, certainly in television, because I went I went from features. Um, I then did then went to Imagineering, which at the time was just called WED to work on Epcot. Um, came back to work on some special projects. And then um, again, there was about a year, year and a half where I don't know how I got by with a paycheck. Um, I mean, why they were keeping me on. Um, and then when TV animation started, I was invited to the first meetings there and then went back, considered leaving Disney, although I was looking around for maybe I should try freelance work. And I talked to the television people and they said, I forgot they wanted me from day one. So I ended up in TV animation. Uh, but there, my job was to hire people more talented than I was in each area. So um, I always was quick to, to you know, go to defer to another artist. Now I drew all the time, but it was usually in the form of notes and yeah. little drawings and expressions and things that I wanted or to have them push something, especially on Darkwing, which, you know, is, was at the time our most, you know, cartoony show um, and more of a Warner Brothers flair to it in a lot of ways than a traditional, certainly a traditional Disney feature look. Um, so the other thing I have to say is, I, about the time I retired, I was invited to my first convention as a as a guest. I'd been to conventions on my own and have been on panels, you know, connected to the company. But um, they gave me a free table, and it's like um, I have nothing to sell because Disney owns all my characters, you know, and the few that Disney doesn't own, other people own. Mm -hmm. um, so that's when I said, I bet you I can squeak by just doing original artwork because it's my interpretation of the characters um 
And then, so I was just drawing constantly and that improved my art a lot <laughs> to the extent where some of my artists that used to work for me say, wow, you've really gotten good at drawing these guys. Said, yeah, it would have been good if I did that maybe when I was on the show. You know, but... <laughs> So that that helped out a lot. But I mean, that's always been part of my uh, nature. I can't even on my favorite shows, uh, which are Darkwing and Hellboy. Um, there's a lot of great stuff there. And especially when we got the really strong studios. Um, but I just see what I would change. I just see like, I mean, it has a certain pace to it that today we're used to faster pacing things. So it's like, even the best episodes of Darkwing, I could probably go and cut three minutes out of it, you know, just trimming and tightening things up. So that's kind of the same thing that happens when I look at my own work. And uh, and uh, sadly, when you retire, it's kind of like, yeah, I look at my life that way. Oh, why did I do that? You know. <laughs> but, so. but I think it's great that you do go back and watch the episodes, though, because they are fantastic. I think as an adult, I do get a certain, I get an extra appreciation for the shows I don't think I had when I was younger. Oh, yeah. I mean, we did it. I mean, the cliche is you write for yourself, but you you write for yourself acknowledging that this has to be understandable to a young kid. Um, but we still did what we thought was funny. And then the, and there's awful, there's obviously humor in it that it's not that it's sophisticated. It's just that, oh, a kid's not going to know the reference or people in 10 years won't know the reference, but it tickles us. You know, we had, uh, what is it? Dr. Gary and Dr. Larson um, because we love the far side so much. So yeah. it was Dr. Gary and Dr. Larson. They come from the far side of the galaxy, you know, uh, the things like that were thrown in. Um, but, you know, again, as far as storylines, uh, we, tried at at least in all my shows at disney it was always like don't go with the cliche stories in saturday morning it used to be like okay there's the birthday show and the circus show and the and the mind switching shows and in all these things that there was one guy who made a great living and he had a rolodex and he would just say new show okay i can go back to number one and here i'm going to pitch all these uh if we took those things on our goal was to we're going to do it in a different way or a funny if you can prove to me that you can make this a, a really fresh thing or a funny thing uh yeah go for it you know we're, we're not going to stand on some goofy principle saying that you know no this is this is an old idea we we will not you know sully our hands with such things uh no it's wherever whatever was interesting to us or fun to us you know one of our great episodes on Darkwing was uh, Twin Beaks. And that was, you know, no kid watching, <laughs> hopefully was not watching Twin Peaks when it was on. <laughs> um, and that one I ended up having to write because Jen Stranod, who's is a great writer and a, and a science fiction writer and a comic, you know, a writer. Um, Jan is the one who came up with the idea. And I said, okay, but it's got to be totally understandable to someone who has never seen the show. Uh, and he took a shot at it, but there was stuff that was, you know, oh, I get it, but that's just a reference. There's no context for it. It makes no sense unless you've seen the other show. And it's just kind of like, I'm going to put in a lady with a log because there's a log lady in a show. Well, to a kid, it's just like, why is that woman carrying a log? Uh, and I realized after going over it with him that it would be unfair to continue. I mean, he was on staff, so it wasn't like I was taking money from him. Um, but it'd be unreasonable for me to keep having him work on it because what I would allow was really subjective to my point of view as to what I thought was, you know, something that would get by and a kid would be amused at and it would still comes from the show and i felt really great about it because when we finished it i mean uh one of my favorite story editors kevin hops had never seen twin peaks he loved that script he says it's got such a weird feeling to it and i we always felt like oh we should do more things like that find shows to imitate that we can just you know do our twist to it but our schedule was so tight you went with the stories you had 
So mm -hmm. unless I said that to every story editor and every story editor got enthused by it, they're going with premises that have been pitched to them by writers. And they're, you know, again, it's like, is this a good sh show? Yeah, this, I mean, a good story. Yeah, I think this is a good story. Lots of comic possibilities. We weren't in the position to like put that aside until we got the Twin Beaks 2 or something, you know. I, later on, we found out that on, um, I think it was Tiny Toons and probably Animaniacs 2, they, because our writers, there was no, you know, there was no battle between studios because, you know, people from our shows went and worked over there and vice versa. Um, over at Warner Brothers on Tiny Toons and Animaniacs, um, they did more scripts than they had to use so they could throw out a script and my jaw dropped i said oh the idea that if i get to the end and say oh the script isn't quite there and i could throw it away or, or save it for later that would have been great we did not have that ability if it got into the outline stage it had to basically had to go and certainly in the script stage so um you know, that's kind of a luxury. The guys on DuckTales, the the new one, the 2017 DuckTales, um, I showed them my schedule, which was like uh, do a script, one script uh, one week, and then two scripts the next week, one script, two scripts, one script, <laughs> like that. And they had this huge thing that they thought they were crunched on. And I remember when I first met them, one of the writers said, well, how big was your writer's room? And I went, <laughs> writer's room <laughs> and guys came in pitched me stories and we, you know i made sure that they had a story whether it was the one they pitched or not to go out and write up um so anyway again that's me rambling all over for whatever question <laughs> <you> asked. <laughs> no, that was a, a great response um so when you're developing uh darkwing duck right which is you know, one of the classic characters i always wondered when you were I'm developing the concept. Was it more Batman or was it more the shadow that you were um, uh, not well, satirizing or being um, paying homage to? Well, to, well, to begin with, it was James Bond in that I don't know why there's a story on the Internet that connects uh, a Rocky and Bullwinkle show that we were going to do with Darkwing because it was like we were developing a, a Rocky and Bullwinkle show. Uh, because we thought we had the rights I and mean, we were told to. And I said, I love that stuff. So, you know, we did some sample scripts. Mike Peraza did artwork for it. Um, and it was what it turned out is our, our bosses didn't check it out and that they had Disney at the time had the video distribution rights, literally the videotapes in stores. They didn't have rights for anything else. So there's a story on the internet that because that one, we needed something really quick. And I don't remember that being the case at all. I There was no panic because the Bullwinkle thing was, it wasn't like, oh, this is going to be our show for next year. It was like, do we think we can do one? Yeah. Um, where Darkwing Duck came from was Jeffrey Katzenberg. Jeffrey, uh, I don't know whether he, he must have heard the episode title, at the very least, of a DuckTales episode called Double O Duck. And it featured Launchpad and the Quack in a James Bond parody. They did another superhero episode of Scrooge, the mid, I want to say the Midnight Mallard or the Mass Mallard, whatever. People think that that influenced Darkwing. And it's like, I never saw the episode. In fact, I still don't believe I've seen the episode. My orders came literally from Jeffrey, who said two things. He says, I like the title Double O Duck. Develop a new show with that with a new character, it can't be Launchpad. So Launchpad was never part of the original development. The whole point was you create a new show, you need a new character. So he just liked the title. Um, I didn't really believe in it a lot because it was just a James Bond parody and um, and which is a bad attitude on my, uh, my part. But this is before Austin Powers. Um, it was just like, okay, well, there's got to be a Q and there's got to be an M. And you just went through the obvious gags. And at least the hurdle we got over was, well, to begin with, it was just um, just a parody. And I didn't, it didn't feel Disney to me in that. It didn't have a lot of heart. 
And I don't even think at the beginning I was thinking of how wild it would be. Maybe, I don't know, um, in terms of breaking the fourth wall and stuff. Uh, I pitched it to Jeffrey and he said, this doesn't feel Disney, it doesn't have a heart. It's, you know, and, and luckily, because these days, the more typical thing would be to, I'll get somebody else to do it. Uh, he gave me, and he told me to do it over again. So now I was forced to actually be original, which obviously I should have done the first time around. And it was Dwayne Capizzi, one of the guys who was on staff, who I knew I wanted as a story editor on the show. He looked at those early drawings of, Double O Duck, which was basically Donald Duck in a white tuxedo and a mask and a hat and a cape. And he says, you know, dressed like that, he's, he, he feels like one of the old pulp heroes, like Green Hornet, the shadow. Mm. And that was like a light bulb in my mind because I love that stuff. I mean, I was too young to have seen that or to, you know, listen to it on the radio, but I had tapes and, you know, kind of through comic collecting and all that you rubbed up against that stuff i had heard plenty of the shows and i loved the idea uh and certainly who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men the whole shadow thing um so and actually it was like uh, doc savage had this team of guys who were very eccentric and they had specialties like this guy was a chemist this guy was communications this is mechanical engineering um and it's like oh that's a way to build a spy group that isn't patterned after James Bond. It's more unique. Um, but as we kept working on it, it's just too many people. When you do a show, at most, if you're doing a team, you want five people. Because the, like Rescue Rangers, you have five characters. And then they're going to help somebody. Well, that's at least one more character. And that person's in trouble because of some villain. So there's another character. And he may have henchmen. So you just have too many characters to juggle around. Um, you end up with, you know, people being forgotten or left behind or, or whatever. Um, so Darkwing kept whittling it down. And um, the biggest breakthrough mentally for me is we pitched it. Well, the, the original breakthrough that gave it heart was adding Goslin to it, um, which made the show. And that's because it gave it heart. And I love Calvin of Calvin and Hobbes. And I said, that's just that's a female Calvin. Calvin. I love the idea um, to create a female character who we just have as much fun with as the male characters. And because of that, those two really Darkwing and Goslin had to have a real tight bond because they had to drive each other crazy. Uh, anyway, that, that, that sold the show. We went out, we started selling it as double O duck. And then, uh, Disney found out once again, hey, we don't have the rights to that name because Double O um, squeaks by all the time as, you know, under the radar as parodies. But um, that's not a thing. It's an Ian Fleming thing. He invented it. And it was Cubby Broccoli was the name of the producer who did all the Bond films. And uh, Disney got a, a letter <laughs> and said, you can't do that because obviously they didn't it would be a big enough deal that they didn't want to say, oh, this is a silly, goofy thing. We, we're trying to, every once in a while, they revamp mm. Bond, obviously. Um, so we need a new name. And, uh, you know, having worked so long with the double O name, I had no, that's all I was thinking of. So I couldn't come up with anything. Uh, we had a contest and uh, people you know, a lot of alliteration entries in that contest. And it was won by Alan Burnett, who came up with Darkwing, which is one of those Nightwing, Darkwing. I never thought of anything like that. And I just said, that's perfect. Darkwing is what he thinks he is. But by putting duck on it, it sounds sillier, which is closer to what he actually is. Uh, Alan was on staff for, I don't know how much longer, uh, not on Darkwing, but just in general at Disney. He was, you know, his talent was very obvious so he was looking at disney features not i mean television animation features i think he was developing including a darkwing feature uh anyway he went on of course to be the the uh, story editor on bruce tim's batman um you know the first version and then he stayed at warner's until he retired and kind of overseeing in some ways the stories of i think every superhero show that was over there and plenty of others so once we lost the name Double O Duck, outside of having 
that spy background that although I don't know that we addressed it in my mind it's like yeah that's where Darkwing gets his money <laughs> that, that's who <laughs> pays for the smoke bombs uh I was really free to go more Silver Age of Comics which is what I grew up with so when I was a kid Silver Age of Comics are just really goofy look at even Batman covers from the 50s and, and early 60s and it's just ridiculous stuff batman's wearing rainbow colors there's he's fighting aliens from outer space jimmy is olsen is a giant turtle man or the elastic lad um and the flash had all these great covers luckily the internet was around when we did darkwing but it wasn't a visual medium yet it was all text-based for the most part um so thankfully i couldn't look up all those old flash flash covers because i think i would see them and say oh it's a great idea but now we can't do it because they did it you know but yeah. instead i half remembered things like flash being a marionette or flash being really fat or the mirror master and you know all that half remembered stuff became the grist for you know the darkwing duck universe so you know liquidator was actually based on the sandman from Sp spider-man and a lot of the ways that he took care of the liquidator in that open in his first episode uh were things that peter parker and spidey used against sandman uh he was not based on hydra man because that's the era where i did not read comics um then uh bush root the vegetable villain was based on um swamp thing a little bit and um plant man not poison ivy plant man was a character who was in strange tales fought the human torch twice and the first time strangely enough he had a big wide hat and a cloak <laughs> um, but the second time he showed up he was like dressed all in leaves and that image was with me in the creation of bushroot where we made him a plant and the idea that swamp thing could in the Alan Moore series could send his pollen into the atmosphere and they would each be part of the intelligence kind of let us, you know, run a lawnmower over bush root and he, he could re-sprout and, you know, grow again. Um, so all that stuff was, you know, in a salad mixer in my brain. And uh, <laughs> that's what made Darkwing really fun for me and just kind of shooting out great, great ideas. Um, I mean, fun ideas that, that other people turned great, you know, that we had a lot of fun with. I love Battle of the Brain Teasers with the idea that these brain teasers are hats <laughs> that people wear, you know. That was a, a fun way to play with the multiple identity stuff. So so one thing I always wondered about Darkwing Duck, um, what did he do for a day job? Like, did he like, did you ever consider, because I know Drake Mallard is, is, is the alter ego. Do you, did you just I intentionally like, never although there's some episodes where he had to be a salesman with Herb Muddlefoot I think um I intentionally did not give Darkwing a job because again my childhood I grew up with shows and reruns of shows like Father Knows Best um and some of the other ones like that where the dad and Ozzy and Harriet actually where he would just come in at the end of the day and like Mr. Rogers kind of take off his coat and put on a sweater kind of thing or light up a pipe. You never knew what he was doing because it didn't matter to the show. You were watching the adventures of the kids or whatever. Um, so that's how I did Darkwing. There was one character that even in the pitch days, I said, we don't need this character. And that was Tank. Tank Muddlefoot is uh, Honker's brother and uh, a bully. And I realized that, wait, yes, Darkwing has to live in a neighborhood and that provides complications, but we want our adventures to be these big superhero adventures. And when we do, it's going to be Honker and Goslin going with Darkwing, not we don't need complications to the kids' lives. Uh, but in the pitch, when he when my boss turned over the card because we these things were on like colored artwork mat boards that they'd be pitched you know well before powerpoint where you just would present and flip over a card um 
when he would mention Tank Muddlefoot, it always got a laugh. So it's like he was in. And then after a while, I always say that he went the way of um, um, various, like Richie Cunningham's older brother, who basically bounces basketball upstairs and never returned. <laughs> <laughs> they just, you know, it was just like, we're not going to talk about that character anymore. So. <laughs> That's awesome. So when you're thinking about when you were developing the story of for Darkwing Duck, and like I said, you had Goslin, who we'll say is a great character. In your mind, is she kind of like the true hero of Darkwing Duck's world or is Darkwing Duck, you think, more heroic? Because I feel like Goslin, just as often, is the one who kind of makes, you know, uh, saves the day than it is uh, Darkwing. I mean, Gosling is probably my favorite character. I mean, at, at the time, certainly. And the idea, it wasn't like who's, it was still Darkwing show, but it was, well, as Frank as Gonis said, uh, again, Frank and Gonis was a co-producer on the new DuckTales. And in our first meeting, he of course brought up Darkwing because that's the show he always really wanted to do. And he said, oh, Tad, we know that, because I was saying Goslin's very important. He said, oh, no, Tad, we know that Darkwing is the story of a father and a daughter and a launch pad. Mm. Um, so it really was that trio that were at the heart of every show. So it wasn't like, oh, we should bring Goslin in here because he has a daughter. It was like, no, she was, you know, later on, the, the short way of describing it is what if Batman had a little girl who refused to stay at home? That really sums it up that she was so formidable he could lock her in her room or i suppose but she picked the lock or dig a tunnel or you know <laughs> blow something up um and she wasn't particularly the smartest you know that's what honker was for um she was not perfect at all it was like no we're treating her like any other comedic character whereas i mean i known for two female characters the previous one was gadget that people say gadget is is wow that uh, you know women come up to me at convention say it was so rare to see a female character who was formidable in some way you know even though she was a bit oblivious to things um and i it was just a matter of no i'm treating her like she's a funny character too and you know giving her as much to do as i would any of the other characters um but all that stuff really had an impact on some of the audiences when they grew up to become adults same with Darkwing and Goslin. that relationship was key to a lot of uh kids with broken homes mm -hmm. that it was just especially you know women who've talked to me that just you know I told the the writers I said they there's got to be no question that that they love each other. I mean, that's it. And we would make them hug each other. And that a lot of that wasn't done in cartoons at the time. It, it used to be that female characters were hard to find on Saturday morning. And then when they were brought in, they began this thing where, uh, I mean, I had a story editor who, who complained that, he says, you know, the guy can be a moron, but you know, the female character can't do anything wrong. She's gotta be perfect. And for a while, that was kind of how things were. And what that did is, oh, look at all these boring characters, you know. So it was like a disservice. And uh, finally, I think writers found a way to do it. But for me, it was just a matter of she should be funny, too, you know. And Goslin was way in on her, you know. So, you know, and again, we were dealing with a a different universe than DuckTales. And people get upset that I say it's a different universe. <laughs> but what I mean is there were different rules to that. Um, as I say, it, if you drop a safe on Scrooge McDuck, there's a mess on the sidewalk. If you drop a safe on Darkwing Duck, you'll see the, the dial spin, the door open, he'll come out looking like an accordion or something. Um, so we could take liberties, you know, with the how much energy the characters had and, and you know, how they just played in animation. And I didn't want to toned down Goslin for any reason it was like no she was a cute design uh by Toby Shelton uh who designed all the lead characters and redesigned Launchpad and uh you know it was the relationship is what uh, is made it easier to write in some ways because like oh how do I make this different well usually <laughs> there's not this little girl here causing trouble so 
So when you were envisioning uh, Gaza, as the story went on, she started taking on different kind of superhero personas over, over time. If the series had continued, do you think she would have found one and kept to it and been a more official Robin to Darkwing? You know what? Um, well, that would really been that would be sad for Launchpad. <laughs> the <official laughs> you know what? Um, who knows what would have happened because it's it's like putting your mindset. It's not like a logical continuity. It's just like what's entertaining. And she was like this natural archer, so she came up with this quivering quack personality. So again, some editor would say, "Oh, I want to bring her back again." I'd say, "Fine." You know, as long as you have a story that goes with it. Um, but if you if you make her a superhero, then you lose. Um, like if you actually gave her superpowers or something, it would be a great one story because that would really be hard on Darkwing's ego. But now you just have a story of two superheroes. It's not really a father and daughter thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, you can make anything work, but that dynamic again to have launchpad be the sidekick and a certain relationship to darkwing and and goslin is a daughter and and her relationship and launchpad had a relationship to to honker that was very sweet um that was just more interesting to me and it's like in comics you'll see changes to characters and suddenly the dynamics all change because they've done something drastic with a sidekick or or a secondary character. Um, a lot of times it seems like in comics, you know, you have one Batman and then there's two and then there's three and then everybody's a Batman, you know, or everybody's <laughs> got superpowers or, you know, it turns out everybody's a man, you know. Um, and it, you can tell viable stories that way, but generally what happens is you go along and then someone says, okay, this is ridiculous. We're gonna reboot everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're going to have, oh, and this happened and we're keeping this because we like it and this because we like it and everybody else goes away. And now we're starting this, you know, the universe over again, and which has happened several times. Um, I mean, I used to think of the golden age of comics as being this far off, crazy time where there were completely different versions of, you know, the Flash and and uh, Green Lantern looked entirely different and different powers. Um and really, the span of time was like way less than the time in which I was collecting Marvel Comics. Um, and But there's just more of a sense of continuity and keeping that order where as opposed to they went out of fashion, nobody bought them. Oh, let's bring that back and see if we can you know, sell some comics. Um, so anyway, with the, with an animated show, ours was particularly not continuity you know, based. I mean, I've said that um, Darkwing Morgana, you know, personality wise, I could see them ultimately getting married. And some people have interpreted that as, oh, if the show had gone on, they would have gotten married. And it's like, I doubt it. Again, that would have been a whole different thing. Um, and even in the comics, you know, she's definitely seen as, as a, a ones when they oh, of course we're having different versions of the comics coming out but sometimes she gets a way bigger role than i initially intended um but i love the characters but, but i do feel personality wise it's like yeah there'd be fun in doing that um and she brought the whole dr strange supernatural side dr strange slash adam's family you know version <laughs> that we didn't always serve her well i think in in our shows well, I think the great thing with um, Organa Macabre is that she does, she, she's one of the few, especially the villains, who does develop as the series goes on. Now, yeah. when you first developed Morgana, was she intended to eventually be the love interest, uh, or like I said, maybe the Catwoman to uh, Darkwing's Batman? I would say the Catwoman uh, Batman thing is probably accurate. I don't know that. Yeah, I think there was always an attraction there. I didn't, again, I didn't plot out the series that way. We didn't have time to, and and we certainly didn't have, this is what we're going to do this season, because all the Dark Wings were done in one season, except for the second season on ABC. So even though they're arbitrarily divided up into seasons, they really were all done, you know, 
in one fell swoop. Um, but I really liked her at her introduction and her single episodes. One of a lot of people's favorite episode is a two part of the team up show of Justice Justice Ducks. And that one I cringe at because Morgana really became more of a damsel in distress or she was on lack of confidence. And it's like, ah, oh, I didn't catch it at the time, but it's like she was, she dealt with literal monsters all the time. So it would be hard to scare her. You know, when I look at something brilliant, like uh, uh, speaking of people, I was at Disney with uh, Tim Burton's um, uh, Wednesday currently on Netflix. That's, such a great rendition of the character and that vibe of how they treat weirdness and all that. It's like, yeah, there's plenty of things to do with Morgana that would have been, you know, fun making more of that, not just making her one of the team. Well, I think one of the great episodes with Morgana, and it, it, I guess it became, it stayed, I mean, I love it. I guess it became most infamous is the Hot Spells episode that got banned yeah. on Disney Plus. So, Having watched the episode, why in the world is that a banned episode? It's, it's so it well was done. just, you know what, there's there's a certain laziness and a fear that happens in when people are taking series and putting them into a new format. Um, ABC aired it. It was an ABC episode. And basically, Goslin makes a deal with the devil. Now, that is a literary conceit of Devil and Daniel Webster and, and you know, Crossroads. And it's just, yeah, in literature... That's been done a zillion times and certainly in film too. Um, it's like making a deal with a genie and how do you trick the genie out of it and all of that. But on ABC, it just takes X amount of letters from, you know, con very conservative, you know, Christian groups uh, to get it banned and on ABC. Mm. But then it's within Disney. It's like, oh, we don't want to, we say we syndicate in those same areas and all that. Uh, so suddenly it's out of the syndication package or, you know, because it was a troublesome thing. And then when they go to put something on another channel, all that, it's like nobody gets nobody gets in trouble for saying no. <laughs> um, I used to say we had lawyers talk to us about um, what was parody and satire and what would be, you know, plagiarism or, or whatever and it's like if you wanted to parody something you follow these rules and you can parody anything you want uh in practice after we had all those lectures we'd try something like that and we'd still get a no back from legal and that's what i said at the time i said yeah nobody gets in trouble for saying no <laughs> because it never happens right, but if they right. say yes to something and it creates a problem then it's like who did this who is it okay you know um and I think that's what happened to Hot Spells, that it just is out of there. I mean, another another example that pains me of, of ignorance slash laziness, I don't know which, is when, um, except for, I guess, the original distribution on a VHS tape, the original, the pilot for Darkwing, Darkwing Doll and the Duck, had an extra minute and a half or certainly a minute to it, including one of the best examples of how Darkwing works as a hero and a broad, you know, physical comic at the same time. And that was, and we did it intentionally to be cut in that we would show our pilots, our multi-part pilots as a movie on like a Friday night. And then the series would start on Monday. Um, well, that, time slot was just a little bit longer so we would have to then cut it down i said well i've got it we've got this theme song we'll animate that as exactly a minute and then when it goes into the show we just play the regular theme song and cut that but then when it went to dvd and all of that nobody went back and got that original opening which again I wish I had, once I came back from our Australia studio, I should have shown that to the crew once a week because it was a perfect example of how to, you know, how one second he's a hero and the next second he's barely making it, you know? Right. Um, so, I mean, that's, again, it's that's not for content, but it is a thing where people are just saying, oh, 
look, these have all been cut into a half hour. We are releasing those half hours. We're on DVDs. No one goes and says, wait a minute, is this the only time this is? You know, there's no one there to say, hey, there's more footage here. Um, so with hot spells, again, it's kind of like, um, I don't know why it's not in there. I'm not going to do any research to find out why it's not in there. So I'm thankful at least that opening of Darkling Dawn, Dawn's the Duck is out on YouTube. Mm. And you can search for it and find it. If it gets taken down, it usually pops up again. So, so, uh, that's out there. so another great uh, guest in Darkwing Duck is Gizmo Duck, which is a great character. And he's, and he, I think he's at his best when he's in the episodes with Darkwing Duck. Now, when you're looking at someone like Gizmo Duck, who's sort of like the Superman to Darkwing Batman, um, which character, in your opinion, has the bigger ego? Was it Darkwing or is it Gizmo Duck? Oh, Darkwing. Darkwing. Because because Gizmo Duck actually does have superpowers, and he just sees himself as I mean he just presents himself as this well like Superman like a Boy Scout you know and so it's not honor you know to get his the key to the city would be thank you Mr Mayor and it would be he would say something very nice and where Darkwing would be all about him which is why it's so great that those uh two are together because gizmo gets all the adoration that darkwing would love and people have trouble remembering his name um so yeah darkwing easily has the the biggest ego and that's where most of his episodes come from i mean our we weren't religious about it but our kind of rule in darkwing because early on an executive asked me how can you have jeopardy if a safe falls on him here and then we got to go to a commercial how do we have any suspense I said, because everybody looks scared and we play scary music and it worked <laughs> as opposed to say falls on him. And a moment later, he walks out of it like an accordion. Um, so, you know, that kind of it's nothing now, but this was before Aladdin and the idea of breaking the fourth wall. Or I love the episode where um, I think it's comic book classics or comic book capers. I forget which. Um and people, Darkwing is is irritated at how his comic book is being written, and he's not getting a piece of it either. Uh, so finally, he takes over the writing of it. But then Goslin wants to write it, and then Binky Muddlefoot comes in and writes part of it. And every time somebody writes it, the real adventure going on changes, and uh, so he's got to he's experiencing it on two levels. And to the point where somebody puts down a coffee cup on the artwork and Darkwing and Launchpad run into a giant co coffee cup. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I love when we broke the format and stuff like that. And that was, you know, after a while, after many episodes, everybody got on board. They understood what we were doing. But uh, that was ground. We had never done anything like that at TV animation. And so it helped that Warners was doing had done Tiny Toons, was doing Animaniacs um, and Tiny Toons, yeah. Um, because there was always a thing where, you know, as separate as Disney was, there's always a few executives that kind of look over at the competition that's doing well and say, hey, why can't we get a little more of this? You know, I mean, I remember with you know, I loved in Rescue Rangers Gadget's invention of the Ranger plane, which is this goofy, you know, tinker toy, helium balloon, you know, construct. Um, and my boss, whose son was way into G.I. Joe, wanted them, can we get a cooler thing? And it's like, well, we tried the Ranger wing for a while, which was like based on a boomerang. But it's still, it was in our universe. So it's, it wasn't a G.I. Joe attack vehicle, you know? So there was always that feeling of, can you make that more like the competition? Well, luckily for us, um, when Darkwing was, you know, in the works, I, I'm not sure of the dates, but Tiny Toons came out. And so it was like, oh, we were already there. <laughs> <laughs> if, if they said, oh, make it more like that, it's like, we're already doing it. So they didn't have to. Um, so it benefited from that sort of thing. So when you're looking at once again, uh, like Gizmo Duck and, and Darkwing, is one being a hero more for the right reasons than the other? No, because they're both. I mean, deep down, Darkwing is 
trying to do the right thing and he's not making money out of it he's not being darkwing to become famous he just thinks it's pretty cool that he does this stuff and the world should recognize how cool it is you know and sometimes we would you know push that um oh i meant to make this point earlier we had a rule kind of it weren't religious about it where uh because he could get smashed at one point and live in another point um that basically Darkwing generally had something to learn and often it was bound up to his ego. And if he hasn't learned the lesson, the fate works against him. And then once he goes, oh, I'm supposed to accept Goslin as a whatever, um, then the anvils tend to fall on the other guy. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it was like, dealing with this non-continuity a little bit of continuity what's our universe like the rules a lot of it we found out it's you can have a you can be arbitrary not 100 percent arbitrary about it but you can basically go with the flow if it just feels right i always point to raiders of the lost ark and you know one of the famous scenes in movies is you know indiana jones on the front of a truck and a car in front of them, the car starts slowing down so that they're going to crush Indy and Indy instead crawls underneath the truck and comes up the back. And it's like, the plane is not going to leave without you. <laughs> if you're the guy you want to kill, maybe you pull over, pull out a gun, shoot at him a lot. You know, that would basically work. You don't think of that because it's so thrilling as it's unraveling, you know, mm. happening on, on the scene, uh, on screen the uh and the same thing happens with comedy if it just feels right it's like you no know, being goofy here is going to hurt the sentiment of the moment or being sentimental here is going to come out saccharine because it's not in the right place you know those are all judgment calls that we made on the fly and sometimes they worked out better than others and then man you have this whole other level when your script goes to a storyboard team and they're kicking it and they're finding other, you know, gags to put in and how they pose him. And then you have the voice actors giving so much. And I also often point this out about Jim Cummings uh, and Chris Cavanaugh too, who did Goslin. Um, even though I've literally been in other countries like Belgium and Russia, we're huge fans of the show. But the characters had different voices, of course, in somebody speaking their language. So even though Jim Cummings and Chris Cavanaugh weren't their Darkwing and Goslin, those were the voices we heard, we were entertained by, and then we began writing to them. Mm. So that little things that, you know, Jim did, I think like his, yep, 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 that he would do, um, was an ad lib by Jim, which we then put into scripts because that's how Darkwing as a character was built, you know? Um, and so we were, you know, we did things on the fly, tried to chase what was fun. His famous, um, I am the bubble gum that sticks to the bottom of your shoe kind of thing. Originally, that was not Darkwing. He was just going to say the same thing, like the shadow every time, you know, I am the tear the flaps in the night. I am the nightmare that, pecks at your dreams and whatever it is something pecked at dreams or nightmares um whatever it was the same thing but then early on thank goodness there was a script where launchpad was mistaken for darkwing so he had to pretend to be darkwing and he could never get the line right and it was hilarious and i just said we have to give that to darkwing so we rewrote the earlier scripts that had been done and that became part of darkwing thing and then like did it hurt launchpad things no they were still funny but I, I wasn't going to worry about that when I got this thing that would help the entire series. Mm. Well, um, not too long ago, in, in, in the recent history, um, there was, as you mentioned earlier, there was a reboot of DuckTales, and Darkwing Duck does appear in the DuckTales reboot in, in some form. So how did you feel about how those handled Darkwing's in, introduction to the DuckTales world? And does that impact what Darkwing's going to look like in the reboot that I've heard about? No, I mean, I mean, I enjoyed it. I thought it was genius. I mean, here's my 
I mean, I'm a creator and sometimes fans don't get this when they say that typical thing is they announce a reboot of something and they say, well, they better fill in the blank. They better have Jim Cummings do the voice. They better have such and such director back on it, you know. Um, for a creator, I don't want, you know, look at this. I did Chippendale's Rescue Rangers. That's pretty far from Chippendale, any Chippendale cartoon. <laughs> One, they were naked in all those cartoons. I don't know how Disney got away with that. They were just no clothes at all. Um, we at least gave them coats, if not pants. Uh, anyway, so that same liberty, if somebody else is going to, it's Disney's, you know, character. If they're going to reinvent it or, or just bring out a new version, there's no reason. And, and fans would love the exact same show they grew up with, just better, you know, like better film grain, <laughs> you know, more in-betweens or whatever. Um, but that's, again, nobody calls it show art. It's called show business. And you have to have a reason to bring back a show. Um Teenage uh, Ninja Mutant Turtles have had many incarnations because if the first one sold a buttload of toys and then some. Um, so that alone is a reason to have another show and it has a mm. different look. Great, we do different style to toys. In the Darkwing Duck reboot that they're talking about, are you involved? Are they talking to you about it? Are they going to I'm a, or consult it? I'm a consultant. And people are confused at, at what that means. And that just means I give my opinion on stuff. It doesn't mean they have to take it. I guess that's what I was talking about previously is that as a creator, I wouldn't want Jack Hanna, who worked with Chip and Dale, standing over my shoulder telling me that what, uh, they didn't wear coats. Um, no, 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 no. Why, why would you be doing that? I, you know, You wouldn't want that. And so when I met the guys on DuckTales. They obviously love Darkwing. I didn't expect them to do the same thing because again, there's not a business reason to do the same thing. Um, and I thought what how they created Negaduck and all that was brilliant. And it's like, yeah, if you pay attention, Darkwing is supposed to be Drake Mallard and they did not violate that. They still didn't, they didn't give an origin to the in that universe, the original TV show, Darkwing, but they gave an, an, an origin to Drake Mallard because he was such a fan of that old show. Um, so with the, the new reboot, I've read some stuff and I went through and I said, here's how I see myself working. You know, I'll tell you the essence of Darkwing and make suggestions that you guys don't have to take to say this is how i would see him working in a situation or not um and you know i expect them to do an original take on it so i gave a bunch of notes on the what i was given i don't know if i'll be getting more but it's not like i mean i see early on i haven't seen it a long while when it was first announced that oh thank god you know tad stones is a consultant on the show he won't let anything happen dude, <laughs> you know, I mean, that doesn't make me in charge. It just means like, yeah, I'm a guy who can, will consult if they want consultation. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, what I saw had was a whole different way of going. They wanted to play it as if it's a continuation of the universe. Everybody's, uh, at least the animated universe everybody's familiar with. Uh, and I said, oh, this, what, this is what I like about this. You know, this is why I think you, you could be on shaky ground here or there. Um, so, you know, we'll see how it goes. And it's, I will say this, they, this is not like, Oh, we're rebooting a show and we're going to put it through the meat grinder. In other words, here's the studio. We'll use our staff artists and, and we'll write this stuff. Oh, let's rewrite that and put it through. They went through casting of directors and casting of writers of looking at a lot of stuff. So they're approaching it. I mean, I mean, my feeling is that from what I've seen, they're approaching it more like a major project as almost as if this was a movie 
saying we want to find the right guy who'd have the right sensibility and sometimes that means that person pitches stuff to them they go oh he's on the right track we like that court sort of stuff um but they're tapped in the movie you know business there is a a point where i guess seth rogan you know talked about what was happening on the new spider-verse movie and he's and he came back and said oh, i think a lot of this is kind of close to what, what we wanted to do or something just you know and um so to me that just shows somebody who really cares about the project and wants it to be unique and and all of that so um last i talked to him was a while but they hadn't even made a decision on is this going to be cg is this going to be 2d sock puppets marionettes i don't know <laughs> uh i'm not sure all of that is on the table but um you know that was my role in it so and so what's next for you sir pardon me what's next for you i'm retired <laughs> <laughs> so, so for a long time i was uh um going to conventions you know selling well like you talked about it you know selling artwork at conventions and all that and that was really fun because i connected to fans that you know, again, my friends, Ron Clemens, Glenn Keane, John Musker, all those guys, when they did work on a feature film, they could then go to a theater and sit there and hear the audience responding. You know how, what worked and what didn't work. With television, we had this thing called ratings, but that didn't mean anything on a visceral level. So it wasn't until, you know, 25 years later plus that I'm at a convention and find out that you know, I have people literally crying in front of me because how important Darkwing and Goslin's relationship was to them. Mm. Um, and that was super fun. And then COVID hit. So, and I just turned 70. So um, going into big crowds, being in airports <laughs> isn't necessarily a thing I want to do. And even though we're all pretending it's gone, yeah, 400 people a day or a week, I think, you know, are still dying of it. Um and I take precautions and I, you know, San Diego Comic-Con did an excellent job from what I understand of making people wear masks on the convention floor. It was super safe, but people who then went outside the convention and did their usual, you know, visiting of bars and, and whatever, tons of them got sick. So uh, I would love to get back to that though. And then here and there, there's a writing thing I'd like to try on my own. My problem was, uh, I always thought, oh, I'll play around with comic books when when I'm retired. Um, but the thing is, and I started that, and my wife said, you can't spend 18 hours a day in that little room, because this room, you can see the wall here. Yeah. That wall is about as far away <laughs> as this one. Um, so, and I realized, yeah, I didn't and I've said this in many an interview, I didn't give up a, a well-paying job in animation for a non-paying job creating independent comics. Uh, but so I couldn't take up the whole day doing it. And it was even a thing like, wait, what if what if this idea is successful? They're going to want me to do more. Then I'm going to have, no, have a job again, you know. Um, but I'd love it here and there. People have asked me, hey, are you interested in writing one of these stories and it's like oh that that sounds like fun let me let me come up with something you know or draw something um so we'll see if any of that happens or pans out i mean there is a couple of there's a couple of projects that i have carried along and uh, one science fiction one fantasy and the science fiction one it was like i used to put out a lot of drawings about it but i realized oh this is a perfect animation project because it was about characters metamorphizing and all that which is great in animation right a still image it's like well you're going to eat up a lot of panels showing somebody mutate constantly so yeah um we'll see yeah we'll see what happens in the in the meantime but yeah i do so i've got nothing specific but uh you know hope to find various creative outlets to keep me going well mr stone's been an absolute honor to talk to you sir i will appreciate it so much and like i said anything you want to talk about again please come back on the show no problem just let me know all right